Hey there everyone, welcome back to Utility Sports. Really excited for this video as the postseason is upon us. And as per usual, I'm coming at you here with my playoffs and play-in predictions. Now remember, the play-in, it's a one-game battle. So chances are I'm gonna get one, maybe both, maybe all of the play-in games wrong. Who knows how that's gonna play out? But these are my predictions. Again, the one-game series are really impossible to predict, but the actual playoff series over the last couple of years, I've done extremely well in, uh, not only with getting the right team selected, but also with the number of games it takes. So I'm very excited. Let me know down in the comment section below who you think is going to win each playing game and also each playoff series. I'm very excited for that. We're gonna be covering the entire first round. We're gonna talk about all of the seating and more. So let's jump into that here. The 9-10 is Sacramento and Golden State. The 7-8 is New Orleans and Los Angeles. The Thunder will be waiting for whoever ends up representing the eight seed and the Denver Nuggets are the two seed. The Wolves who lost to the Phoenix Suns on Sunday will be playing the Phoenix Suns in the first round as a 3-6 matchup. And then we get the trilogy part three of the Clippers and Mavericks video up on the channel covering that series a little bit more in depth. The 9-10 on the other side uh, in the east you've got the Atlanta Hawks and the Chicago Bulls. 7-8 you've got the Philadelphia 76ers and Miami Heat. The one seed is obviously the Celtics. They'll be waiting for whoever ends up being the eighth seed. The Cavs and Magic, 4-5. The Bucks and Pacers, interesting matchup there, 3-6. We'll talk about all of those and more later. And then the Knicks are the two seed. So let's start in the play-in in the Western Conference. The 7-8 matchup, the Los Angeles Lakers and the New Orleans Pelicans. These games will start on Tuesday. Uh, the uh, I believe 7 and 8s play on Tuesday. The 9 and 10s play on Wednesday. And then the... Winner of the 9-10 game will face the loser of the 7-8 game on Friday, April, I believe that's 18th. I'm not exactly sure the exact date number, but that's exactly what we're looking for here. So this matchup, the Lakers versus Pelicans. Well, we just saw the results of that one today. The Lakers beat down on the Pelicans, but that was you know an interesting game, interesting time for the Pelicans there. I don't think that we should put all of our stock into the final game of the regular season when it comes to this playing matchup because it's a fresh, brand new game. Now, what I do think here though, is that the Lakers are poised to still play their best brand of basketball. And one thing that we saw last year, first of all, LeBron James is very experienced in the play and he's been in the play multiple times over the last few years. So he's aware of how this works. Now the Pelicans have had their fair share of playing experiences as well. But when it comes down to who I trust in a single game format, who's going to get me the best looks, who's going to generate the best offense for me, I have to go with arguably the best advantage creator of all time in LeBron James. I just think his cerebral approach to the game, the way that he plays the game, makes me trust the Lakers a little bit more, especially when they have players around him who can get hot. Austin Reeves has had moments over the last year or so that he's taken over ball games. Now I'm not betting on that here, but when LeBron is on the bench, Reeves can be a guy that you hand the ball to and let him go to work. D'Angelo Russell's been playing great basketball as of late as well, really shooting the ball well in the second half of the season. And then of course, uh, when it comes to this matchup, there's always that uh, little bit of drama back and forth um, between Anthony Davis and the New Orleans Pelicans. So that's an interesting little dilemma in here as well. Um, this season, just the fact that obviously AD was traded from New Orleans to LA um, and in the matchups um, since then, he's averaged over 26 points and over 11 rebounds in 14 games against the uh, Pelicans, including on Sunday where he went off for 30 points and 11 rebounds. So he's been playing his best basketball, especially this season. And I think he's going to have a little bit of a chip on his shoulder to knock off Zion Williamson, Brandon Ingram and the Pelicans in the playing game for 7-8. So I have the Lakers moving into the seventh seed, which then turns our eyes to the 9-10 matchup. The Kings will be playing host to the Golden State Warriors. And remember, this is a playoff matchup we had last year in the 3-6 race. The Kings were the three seed, the Warriors were the six seed. Well, these two teams look quite a bit different now in terms of their actual regular season success. The players don't look much different. They've got very similar re remaining cores, no Jordan Poole, for Golden State, and obviously Sacramento's had their fair share of injuries. 
at the end of the year here and because of that I am going to give the edge to the Golden State Warriors which is a bummer for Sacramento given the fact that they were having a pretty good season they've been up and down a bit but the injuries at the end here I think have just kind of shaken them up a little bit rocked their boat uh, if you were to say and because of that I give the edge to the Warriors who already probably were going to maybe have a slight edge from me anyway over Sacramento in recent memory the Warriors have outplayed the Kings but this is a really good rivalry and again single game you never know what can happen dear and Fox can catch fire from three DeMontis Sabonis is still a mismatch nightmare for the Warriors we'll see what they elect to do if it's Draymond Green on him from the start of the game that would be my expectation and I do like the way that the Warriors are constituted to at least deal with Sacramento obviously there is a good deal of history between these two just given the fact that Mike Brown was an assistant coach but for me I'm picking the Warriors here this does have draft pick complications for Sacramento if they do end up missing the postseason their pick which is lottery protected um, in a trade with the Atlanta Hawks will actually stay in Sacramento so it's kind of a big shakeup for them changes their future flexibility quite a bit but it still could be good for them um, if they maybe were to move up in the lottery this year we'll see what happens with Sacramento but I do have the Warriors moving on which means they'd have to play in their way to get the eight seed not only do you have to win one game if you're a 9-10 team you have to win two to get into the postseason and the Pelicans are sitting here after a loss to the Lakers and they have a chance to redeem themselves and still make the NBA playoffs with a date with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Both of these teams should feel like, hey, OKC, super young team. If we get into this eight spot, we can at least push them in a series and give them something to have to overcome. But for the Pelicans here, this is a really tough matchup for me. Again, one game matchups, it's like super impossible to really break down like what you want to hyper analyze on and focus on because really Zion could go off for 35 points in this game because the Warriors don't have anyone to contain him at the point of attack you could make that argument and they don't have a ton of rim protection the Warriors on the other hand you look at their offense and yes Herb Jones is great but with Steph Curry running off of probably 25 screens and Klay Thompson flying off the screens, if Klay Thompson gets hot in a game or Steph Curry gets a few open looks, he's going to pay those in as well. So for me, I trust the Warriors offense. I trust their process a little bit more. Now I do like the way New Orleans plays. I like the movement that they have. I think New Orleans is really poised for a bright future. We'll see what happens with Jonas Valanciunas. But I do have the Golden State Warriors winning here. They fight their way in all the way from the 10th seed to make it to the 8th seed in my predictions. Again, this is one game. For me, the way I'm looking at it, I don't want to bet against Steph Curry. And I did not want to bet against LeBron James. You could definitely disagree with me. I don't have any complaints. It's a one game play in. That's what makes this so unpredictable. So I don't have any disagreements. If you think that Sacramento and New Orleans should have gotten in. Definitely could understand that. They both had good seasons. Sacramento dealing with those injuries like we talked about. New Orleans has had their share of injuries. And if you told me the Pelicans are the 7 or 8 seed, I wouldn't be surprised by that once the play-in's done and over with. Staying in the Western Conference, we're going to stay focused on the Oklahoma City Thunder and the Golden State Warriors in that 1-8 matchup. The Thunder... What a season for them. Before the year, I said very firmly that I believe they were going to be a top four seed in the Western Conference. There was a little bit of pushback in the comment section regarding my thoughts on the Thunder back then. Well, they not only were a top four seed, they were the number one seed, which I don't think I saw coming either. But wow, what a season they've had. Shea Gilgis Alexander's taken another step forward. Chet Holmgren has been literally the missing link in the way that they play, the way they're able to space attack closeouts and, and drive and kick. He just opens up the floor for them so much while still being a key piece defensively as their anchor on that end of the floor. And Jalen Williams just continues to get better. His efficiency, the volume, it's all skyrocketing and getting better and better seemingly each and every night. He had a stretch where it just felt like he was going nine for 12 every single game and you couldn't force him, force him to miss. Uh, the Thunder are a really talented team. They're a really young team but they're really talented. And this is the importance of scheme and fit. When you place players together who are talented and they fit together as well in a system that is cohesive and plays to your player strengths. For example, Shea Gilders Alexander and his ability to drive to the basket, he leads the NBA in drives per game. The Thunder have put him in a position with their spacing, the pace that they play with, and the actual system and scheme that he's playing within to maximize him. And that's why we've seen him reach such historic heights 
there in Oklahoma City with some of his production this season. And the Warriors, likewise, you can focus on the fit and scheme there with the way that Draymond and Curry work together. Draymond kind of being the hub of the offense, Curry running off of a bunch of staggers, Flair's floppy actions. They have their patented post splits, which are so, so good. The Warriors and Thunder are two great examples in recent history of how playing within a scheme that complements your best players typically is going to lead to a ton of success. But for me here, I think Golden State, even though they're a dangerous team, I could see them winning one or two games in this series. I think Oklahoma City is just flat out the better team. I think the Warriors will struggle to deal with Chet Holmgren. I think the hope here for Golden State is that OKC's inexperience leads to some nerves and some mistakes that they typically don't make. But the way that the Thunder are wired, I feel like this team is built for the moment. The way that they carry themselves, the way that they handle themselves, I'm not really worried about them adjusting to the NBA playoffs. I think that they know they're a very talented team. I think they understand kind of the pecking order there, the roles that they're all supposed to play. And for this kind of series, this would be a fun one because both teams like to play smaller. They both like to play fast. You think about Jalen Williams kind of being the pseudo power forward there in OKC. Draymond Green, of course, being the small ball five for Golden State. These teams are going to get up and down the court. I think this could be a big breakout year for Jonathan Kaminga in the postseason specifically when more people are watching. Obviously, he's already kind of broken out this year already, but I think like this is when maybe he builds up some of that big, you know, media following and, and a bigger just brand himself as an individual player because he's going to have some highlight moments in the postseason with his athleticism and two-way play. But when it comes to OKC, I just, again, I trust the way that they're built. I trust their spacing. I trust their lead player in Shea Gilgis Alexander. And I think the one thing OKC has over Golden State, they're just a better defensive team. They've got good defenders all over the floor. Shea Gilgis Alexander has been at the top of the league in deflections and steals. He just does a lot off of the basketball and on the basketball. He has a very good pickpocket rate compared to other players around the league. So with that, I just trust OKC a little bit more. I think their defense is more steady. It has been all season long. And I think the Chet Holmgren spacing dilemma is still going to be a problem for Golden State who already has less natural rim protection the way that it is. We'll see what happens with Josh Giddy. I think that's one of the big X factors in this series for OKC. Is Josh Giddy going to not only shoot the ball, but is he going to shoot it well? And if not, what kind of leash does he have from Mark Degnold? Because if you do want to even trade Josh Giddy going into this offseason, you can't just fully pull him out of the rotation. You have to find ways to make him useful. I think using him as a DHO merchant, someone who can walk into dribble handoffs and kind of generate some downhill driving lanes for some of the other players there in OKC would be beneficial. I think another big question people are going to have, which I'm not as worried about myself, is the foul calls that Shea Gilgis Alexander gets and generates. For me, I'm not worried about that. I know that his talent level will presumably rise above any of that and any of those questions. I think Shea's going to have a great playoffs. And I think for that reason, OKC beats Golden State in either five or six games. I'm going to say five here for the video. I'm going to, I'm going to go with five. I think it could be six. Uh, I'm going to go with six. I'm switching it to six because I'm afraid of Steph Curry. He's a really great player, obviously. The race for 2-7, and can someone say competitive sweep? Just kidding. This is not going to be a sweep. This will be a five-game series because the Denver Nuggets will have one letdown game in the first round when their attention and focus isn't all in there. But the, the Nuggets are going to beat the Lakers. The Nuggets have not lost the Lakers in a very long time. This season series, the Lakers are 0-3 against Denver. The Nuggets just have their number. Even with Anthony Davis being one of the best defensive players in the entire world, he just does not have an answer for Nikola Jokic. Nobody in the NBA has an answer for Nikola Jokic right now. The Lakers do not have enough three-point shooting. That was what really kind of betrayed them last year. In the conference finals, D'Angelo Russell went completely ice cold. The rest of the team just did not shoot the ball very well. Malik Beasley got yanked out of the rotation. And the Lakers didn't have enough offense to keep up with Jokic, Murray, Porter Jr., and Gordon. Not to mention KCP as well. This Nuggets team is just really well built. A lot of credit to Tim Connolly, who initially built this team. Credit to Calvin Booth, who has continued to build up the team with key additions like Peyton Watson, Christian Brown. Trading for KCP as well. A lot of great decisions have led up to this Nuggets team being so unbeatable. And I think the, the key phrase here is, again, role definition. I think everyone falls in line there. They know that Jokic is the star. Jamal Murray's the number two. 
and then the rest of the guys play roles off of that. MPJ is your lethal movement shooter. Aaron Gordon's your versatile front court defender who is also a fantastic baseline runner. And then KCP is your on-ball point of attack defender and screen navigator. And I think the way that they're built with their bench being, I think the biggest question right now, but still promising, I think the Nuggets have what it takes to at least make another deep run in the playoffs if they don't win it all this year. We'll talk about that at the very end of the video. Moving on to the 3-6 matchup, and this is an interesting one. The Phoenix Suns have swept the season series against the Minnesota Timberwolves, which is very bizarre to me, and I cannot tell you why Phoenix continues to have so much success against Minnesota because the Timberwolves are the far better team. The Timberwolves are the league's best defense. They have a really large collection of great perimeter defensive players. You think about Jaden McDaniels, Anthony Edwards, Nikhil Alexander-Walker. Those are the headliners. But Mike Conley's a quality point of attack defender and team defender. Kyle Anderson's a very underrated defender in the NBA. And then you look at what they've gotten out of Nas Reed and Carl Anthony Towns on that end of the floor. They've played better defensively than either of them have ever played in their career. And then the headliner is Rudy Gobert. This Timberwolves team is filled out with great defensive players and they have some good offensive talent with Edwards and Kath. And I think Gobert is such an underrated offensive player for what he provides as a screener and a roller, his rim pressure. And that's really the big X factor for me in this series. Phoenix has no way of dealing with Rudy Gobert's size both when attacking him and they don't have any answer for him on the glass and defensively. Yusuf Nurkic is not going to get the job done against Rudy Gobert. He is that dominant of a player. I think the bigger question is how does Minnesota utilize Gobert? Because at times this year, Anthony Edwards, Carl Anthony Towns phase Rudy out of the offense and it's not by design. It's not that they're intentionally doing it. It's because they are not grade A tier one playmakers like a Luka Doncic, like a Trey Young, like some of the best passers in NBA history. The Wolves don't have that. So when they go to Mike Conley, while Conley is a better passer than Edwards and Cat, Conley at the same time isn't the dynamic scoring option that either of those two are. So Minnesota has this weird infrastructure where they've got a lot of offensive talent, but the offensive talent isn't fully complementary of each other at all times. Now when Ant and Cat are both involving Rudy, this team's unguardable because of the height, the size advantage that they have over other teams. But Phoenix is gonna try and leverage some of their own advantages. One of those things being the power forward spot. With Kevin Durant starting at power forward, you have a lot more length and spacing than other teams would with the type of talent that he has. And you're able to attack Carl Anthony Towns in different ways. What Minnesota has elected to do at, at points is to put Grayson Allen, uh, or to use Carl Anthony Towns on Grayson Allen defensively. That is a mistake in my eyes because Phoenix is able to walk into ghost screens. They're able to generate a lot of open space and looks for their star players because Carl Anthony Towns is busy chasing around Grayson Allen and he's not comfortable switching out into space with either Booker or Beal. So because of that, it gives Phoenix a pretty good advantage in some of their horns action sets that they run uh, and just their overall freelance offense as well with the type of movement that they generate a ton of shooting on the floor. Carl Anthony Towns is kind of the odd man out right now in Minnesota with trying to defend this Phoenix Suns team and it puts their screen navigators, it puts, it puts their point of attack defenders in a real bind because of the perimeter talent that Phoenix has. Now, I don't think Phoenix can afford to go small in this series. I think that will actually be the death of them if they do that. I'm going to pick Minnesota in six games in this series because I do trust their size. I think Minnesota right now is going to the drawing board, trying to figure out things that they like about what they've done so far against Phoenix. There's not a lot to choose from, but I think they're gonna to come to some solutions. It'll be interesting to see if Carl Anthony Towns remains in the starting lineup the entire series. We'll see, to be honest with you, what I would do is I would put Kyle Anderson in the starting lineup, have him guard Kevin Durant, and then off the bench, I would bring both Carl Anthony Towns and Nas Reed together as a four or five combo as soon as one of Drew Eubanks or um, Royce O'Neal come into the game. It gives Minnesota better defensive matchups for Cat and Nas Reed in those moments. And it's going to test Phoenix's depth quite a bit more. And it's going to test their high-end starters too, because their starters are probably going to have to play 40 plus minutes a game in the series. If you're able to fatigue and wear out Phoenix, who's quite a bit older, you're going to be able to get under their skin and win, I think, a series by doing that. Even though Phoenix has dominated the regular season series, 
I still think Minnesota is the better team. I trust their talent. I trust their size. I trust their defense. And I think that if Anthony Edwards figures it out, so far he's been fighting the game against Phoenix. He has not played like himself in the three matchups with Phoenix. If he can figure it out, they get enough film study in between now and April 20th, which is the day that they play. I think Anthony Edwards and the Timberwolves can beat Phoenix, and I think they can beat them pretty comfortably in six games. Moving on to the 4-5 matchup. Again, I have a whole video out detailing this series in depth. This is a bloodbath here. Kawhi Leonard, let's assume he's healthy because if he's not, the Dallas Mavericks are going to win this series. The Clippers need Kawhi Leonard to stay in this series. But if they have him, not only will they stay in the series, they might win it. Because you could argue, even with how great Luka Doncic is, and I myself would have voted him for MVP this year with the year that he had, for me looking at the Clippers, I just really do believe that Kawhi Leonard can match Doncic's play offensively with his dominance as a three-level uh, shot maker, a three-level scorer, and then defensively when he's really dialed in and when you ask him to guard the best player on the other team, not only is he capable of it, he still might be one of the best in the league in that regard. So the Clippers who have home court advantage here, they're going to get a few days of rest, which I think is very important for James Harden and his hamstring, getting him fresh, having fresh legs going into that series. And in the first round, you have extra days of break in between. I think that will be essential for Harden and his health in this series. And then also, can you get a good performance from Paul George? And the Mavericks, I think they're going into the series with a lot of question marks. First of all, it's the first playoff series that we've seen Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic together. Now, I don't have any concerns there. Those two guys are a very good fit together, just like Kyrie Irving was with LeBron James in Cleveland. That has not been super surprising to me. The question for Dallas is who is the third best player for them in this series? And it's not a debilitating question, but it can be if things don't go greatly. Right now, Derek Lively obviously dealing with the passing of his mother. Prayers to him. It's, he's a rookie. He's a 19-year-old rookie going through some life-changing stuff at the same time. So I'm not going to sit here and act like he's going to have a perfect or great rookie season. He's been dealing with injuries as well all throughout the year. Daniel Gafford, though, has been instrumental since Dallas acquired him. I said I love the Daniel Gafford trade the moment that they got him. I think he's a really good big man. I thought he was a perfect fit next to Doncic and Irving. He has proven that. He's just not the caliber of a third player on a roster. His consistency is going to be up and down a little bit night to night in the postseason. I'm very certain of that. But his rim protection and rolling ability will all be important as well as his screen game. And then I think the question is, what do you get from Tim Hardaway Jr. as well? In closeout games uh, and elimination games for Dallas, he has struggled pretty mightily, especially in the matchups with the Clippers. You need to get a good Tim Hardaway Jr. for at least four games in this series. You can have the Tim Hardaway Jr. where he's going one of nine from three or two of 11 from three, and he's just forcing shots up in the first five seconds of a possession because he hasn't taken a look for a little while. You can't get that Tim Hardaway Jr. He's going to be an essential piece with the Clippers trying to switch everything. Hardaway's ability to screen and ghost out of it, slip out of it, make plays like that and, and shoot off of those opportunities is very important for Dallas. But you need to have a consistent version of him. If he's not hitting his shots, his value goes way, way down. So for me with Dallas, they're relying on a lot of players who I'm not super confident in the consistency of. That'll be Daniel Gafford, who I really like. I love Gafford. I think he's a great, awesome player to have. I just don't know if you can rely on him night in, night out in the postseason. Tim Hardaway Jr., I know you can't rely on him night in, night out in the postseason. Dante Exum, we'll see what he looks like. Derek Jones Jr., obviously, has been a vital piece of building up a better defense. And then the real X factor here for Dallas is P.J. Washington. Can he be that third best player for them in the series? That will really come down to if he's hitting his catch and shoot opportunities. He's been really streaky in his career as a shooter. But a lot of the other tools are there. He attacks closeouts extremely well, so if he hits a few shots early in the series, that will set up everything else for him. His mid-range floater, ability to get to the rim and finish at the rim, above the rim. And then defensively, he's probably going to be tasked with Kawhi Leonard for a decent amount of the series. Him and Derek Jones Jr. will probably be sharing that load quite a bit. I think it'll be important for the Dallas Mavericks to fight through screens. I wouldn't willingly switch Doncic onto... Uh, Kawhi Leonard very frequently. I would live with him guarding Paul George or James Harden, but I don't want Doncic being forced to guard Kawhi Leonard frequently, especially early in the series. 
let's move over to the East plan. Actually, I don't, did I give my prediction here? I'm gonna say Mavs in seven, but I could see it really being Clippers. I think this is the closest series in the entire first round. This is going to be a real battle here. The East play in seven, eight. When we look at these two teams, again, this is a one game play in situation. We got the Miami Heat and Philadelphia 76ers, the team that represented the East in the NBA Finals last year, and the team that arguably had the league MVP again this year before he got hurt in Joel Embiid. Now, Embiid did miss game 82 of the regular season. Sounded like that was a precautionary measure for Philadelphia with the couple days of rest here. I think he'll be ready to go for this game. So, with that in mind, I am going to pick the Philadelphia 76ers in this game. While Bam Adebayo is a great defender, one of the most impactful defenders in the NBA, I just still don't think that Miami has an answer for Philadelphia. Just like how we talked about with the Lakers not having an answer for Nikola Jokic, I would say the same thing here. The Heat just do not have an answer for Joel Embiid. When he gets to his mid-range game, he's devastating. When he's at the rim, he's devastating. When he's hitting his shots from deep, he's devastating. He's just a devastating offensive player. Tyrese Maxey's taken ginormous strides forward. I know the 76ers have struggled a bit without Joel Embiid this year. This is again where we talk about role definition. When Embiid is there, everything fits into place. Maxey's the number two. You have Buddy Heald as a shot maker around them as kind of an infrastructure piece that gives you movement shooting, gives you uh, someone that you don't want to help off of if he's standing in the corner or off the break. It's important. And then Nick Batum obviously has been very connective for them this year. Uh, I think getting Kyle Lowry was pretty important for the Sixers depth. Obviously, DeAnthony Melton's been ramping up as well lately. The Sixers team is loaded. The Heat are really good. I think the Heat are really dangerous as well. But I don't think they'll be the seven seed. I think racing for the seven seed is super important. This is one of the most important games of the season here, the seven eight matchup, because whoever gets seven will face the New York Knicks and not have to deal with the Boston Celtics until potentially the conference finals if there are a series of upsets. For the 9 10 playing game, this isn't going to have a lot of long term impact. I'm going to pick the Atlanta Hawks here over the Chicago Bulls. I just trust Trey Young and DeJounte Murray a little bit more. Now, Alex Caruso could have a really big impact in this in this uh, one game play in because he is one of the best defenders in the league. He's a great screen navigator. He does a great job off the ball as well as a tag man and a recovered um, guy who can close out extremely quickly and effectively without getting blown by. My expectation is that Caruso will guard both DeJounte Murray and Trey Young at certain points in this matchup. And he'll do probably a really good job of it. I just think my concern here is how does Atlanta go about effectively trying to, um, or how does Chicago, excuse me, effectively go about trying to hide Nikola Vucevic defensively? And how do they make their life easier by not having him get hunted in the pick and roll all game long? Because not only will that be a problem if they're generating good pull up mid range jump shots for DeJounte and open threes for Trey Young out of that, but if you do have him up at the level and you try and blitz him, chase him off, both of them are good enough passers to hurt you. And then even if they do miss their initial shot, Clint Capella actually led the entire NBA in offensive rebounds this year. So I like Atlanta here. And with that, we have a two team race now for the final spot in the Eastern Conference for the A seed. For me, I have the Atlanta Hawks losing to the Miami Heat. The Hawks beat Miami last year in the 7-8 play-in. Obviously, that set up Miami to go on their huge, massive run where they upset the Milwaukee Bucks in round one. They upset the New York Knicks in round two. They upset the Celtics in the conference finals. This year, I'm not seeing that same story, though, for Atlanta where they're going to beat uh, Miami first. I think Miami's the better team. I think Miami is still extremely dangerous. Obviously, I picked Philadelphia over the Heat in the 7-8 playing game, but it's not to discredit Miami. They're still a real threat. Jimmy Butler, when he turns it on, you can argue he's a top 10 player in the world. And then obviously guys around him, Duncan Robinson, if he catches fire in a game, he can win you a one game play in at any moment in time. And this is why, again, predicting these is so difficult because you're really betting on one game instead of an actual series of strengths and weaknesses that you can see unfold in a seven game series. You have to see them all unfold in 48 minutes. And that's a really tough bet. But for me, I like Miami here. I think Adebayo, again, gives you more defensive versatility than what the Bulls have with Nikola Vucevic. And that's why I think they'll handle this Hawks matchup a little bit better. The Hawks haven't had a ton to play for down the stretch of the year here because they've been pretty much locked into their playoff positioning. I know they got blown out by the Pacers. I'm not going to put too much stock into that. I still think the Hawks, with Trey Young, DeJounte Murray, 
they have enough firepower to get out of that 9-10 playing game, but I don't see them having enough to upset Miami here. The Heat will make the playoffs, and they'll face the Boston Celtics in round one. The past two Eastern Conference Finals have been the Heat versus the Celtics. The Celtics won one of them back in 2022, and in 2023, the Miami Heat upset the Boston Celtics. So it's only fitting that in 2024, we get this matchup again, but this time in the first round. There's a big, clear, substantive difference, though, in Boston from their previous iterations of this team to where they're at now. And it's the reason why they are arguably one of the best regular season teams of all time. When you look at their net rating, their offensive rating, which has been historic this season. You look at their defensive rating. This team is filled out with high quality starting level players. This team is stacked. They've got a lot of great players. And this goes back to my point on Golden State and OKC that I made earlier about having players who fit the way your coach coaches. Joe Mazzulla loves three pointers. Because of that, Boston is sometimes liable to losing games that they shouldn't because if the threes aren't falling, that's a heavy part of their shot diet, so they're not going to be scoring very much. But because of the way that Brad Stevens operates, one of the smartest guys in all of basketball, he has built this team perfectly. Unlike last year where they had non-shooting centers on the floor, um, you think Robert Williams and obviously at times Al Horford who shoots very, very well. I know his efficiency is extremely high for his career as of most recently, especially Al Horford's not a quick trigger three-point shooter, though. Takes him a little bit while, uh, a little bit of time to load up. He's not a super serious threat that teams are, oh my gosh, we better run him off the three-point line, scared of. Chris Ops Porzingis is. And that's been the exact overall difference from a team last year that was really good to a team this year that is great. Him and Drew Holiday, Porzingis and Holiday have just completely transformed this Boston Celtics team. Holiday gives them a lot of defensive flexibility at times guarding big men, guarding power forwards, guarding wing, guarding guards. He guards everybody. He's in the middle of their 2-1-2 zone. He's a unique chess piece for Joe Mazzulla to work with. Brad Stevens understood that for him from a defensive standpoint. And then Porzingis, obviously his length, size, rim protection. Boston going with him as a full-time center has been tremendous for his game. And for the Celtics, they're just a way better team than Miami is this season. And even with Miami's ability to upset teams in the playoffs, Eric Spolster is a great head coach, a, a, a mega mind genius. I just don't think they have an answer here for Boston. I think the Celtics win in five games. I think this is a dominant series for them. Maybe one game that they just don't get their clutch offense quite right and the Heat pull off a, a good upset win over them. But the Celtics team this year is different. They are a mega threat and they're going to advance to the second round, no questions asked. 2-7, we've got the 76ers and Knicks. And this is about the worst case scenario for New York here. You are facing a team that probably would have been the two seed outright if Joel Embiid did not get injured. The 76ers were really a dominant team with Embiid on the floor this year. And again, like I said earlier, the rest of the pieces fall in line. Now the Knicks have a good collection of talent as well. OG Ananobi, the trade for him I thought was genius. I loved what they were able to do bringing him in without having to trade out draft picks. That was genius and just great overall management from Leon Rose and the New York Knicks front office. They've done a fantastic job. Jalen Brunson, the signing was an absolute home run. I liked Jalen Brunson a lot before the signing. I wasn't even close to being high enough on him. He's an incredible player. He should make all NBA first or second team this year. I would put him on all NBA first team. Check out my awards video if you haven't already. The Knicks are great. It's just a scary matchup. I'm gonna go with the upset here. I don't love it. I'm gonna pick the Philadelphia 76ers in seven games. This series could go back or forth. I think the hard thing here for Philly, you have to shake off some of the rust. Buddy Hill does not have a ton of reps playing with Joel Embiid. The 76ers don't have a ton of experience with each other with Embiid in the lineup. So I think that is an advantage for the Knicks. But likewise, the Knicks are also still dealing with injuries. Julius Randle is out. And I just think the Knicks offense is going to be maybe a day late and a dollar short compared to the 76ers offense. Although the Knicks defense has been tremendous. A key X factor for New York if they do win this series. Again, I picked the Sixers in seven games because I have a ton of respect for the Knicks. I think the Knicks are a really dangerous team, a really great team. Dante DiVincenzo could be the guy that really propels them. He has nailed so many threes this year. He's been really a key pivotal piece for keeping this team afloat next to Jalen Brunson, next to Josh Hart. Obviously those Villanova Wildcats all working together. Uh, it's just honestly been great management from New York to put 
a bunch of good players who fit their coach. Again, that's been the theme of this video. The teams that I think are really good all fit their head coach's style of play. The Knicks, uh, you know, kind of exude that as well. But for me, I think Philadelphia just has a little bit more upper end talent. I think Embiid's going to be the best player in the series. And with him coming back, I think this might be the first time we get to see a healthy Joel Embiid postseason. And he's going to have a big run because of that. The East 3-6 now. We have the Indiana Pacers taking on the Milwaukee Bucks. And remember, this season series was a spicy one. The Indiana Pacers and Milwaukee Bucks had some beef this year. Um... It was honestly, you know, think back to the Giannis Antetokounmpo game ball situation. Um, and the the Pacers really dominated the season series. They won four of the five games. Um, now, a lot of those games were relatively close. The first matchup was a two-point win. The second matchup was a nine-point win. The Bucks won the third matchup by 14 points. And then it was another nine-point win for Indiana on January 1st. And a 12-point win for Indiana on January 3rd. So, a lot of these games, all of them in fact, came before the trade deadline. They came all within pretty close proximity to each other, and there have been some significant changes since the conclusion of this season series. One of them for Indiana has been Pascal Siakam, which greatly has improved their defense. The Bucks also, there's a big question right now about Giannis Antetokounmpo and his ability to actually play in this series. Will he be ready to go? He missed the end of the regular season with his calf strain. His calf strain really reminded me a lot of Kevin Durant's um, in 2019 with the Golden State Warriors. Durant would later come back in that playoffs and then tear his Achilles. When he initially hurt his calf, I thought it was an Achilles injury immediately. And when I watched Giannis Antetokounmpo crumble to the floor, I thought it was an Achilles injury. So I have a lot of reservations about Milwaukee trying to bring Giannis back this season. I think they should play the cautious waiting game with him. Obviously, they're on kind of a ticking time bomb right now. They don't have any of their own draft picks really to trade. They have very little flexibility. Uh, they've committed to Damian Lillard, Brooke Lopez, Chris Middleton, a whole bunch of players in their 30s. Giannis is, um, you know, not 25 years old anymore either. So there's a lot of pressure on this team to win this year. For that reason, I think they will try to bring Giannis back. But Indiana has dominated this matchup series. And I think the key X factor to watch here is Miles Turner versus Brooke Lopez. Brooke Lopez is a great talent. And I think they're going to both present to each other the same problem because of their shooting. Brooke Lopez, one of the more proficient pick and pop shooters in the league, him and Damian Lillard are going to work together extremely well in that fashion. The Pacers will probably look to use Aaron Neesmith quite a bit on Dame if I had to guess. Neesmith will also match up with Giannis assuming Giannis is able to go in this series. Neesmith is going to be a key piece for Indiana defensively and because of that I trust their screen navigation quite a bit more than I do for Milwaukee. Now the Bucks did get Patrick Beverly. He definitely helps them a lot in this area especially with being moved into the starting lineup recently. But Milwaukee is still going to struggle against Miles Turner when he picks and pops with Tyrese Halliburton. I think one of the big differences here between Indiana and Milwaukee is the best passer in the series plays for the Pacers. Tyrese Halliburton is a huge offensive weapon. You look at also TJ McConnell off the bench who has had a great season, I think really under the radar for him. Wasn't really in the sixth man of the year conversation, but he definitely had a case that, hey, he was one of the best six men in the league this past season. And I don't really think anyone was expecting it, even though he's had good seasons in the past with Indiana and Rick Carlisle loves him. I think this has been one of the best seasons of his career, arguably, with the impact he has had. You can look at the offensive rating for Indiana with him on the floor. They've just been really, really good. So for me, I think the Pacers are going to be capable of pulling off an upset. I'm going to pick Indiana in seven games. I have a lot of reservations here because Tyrese Halliburton's not been shooting the ball well. This is a good kind of little stretch here of time to rest up before the postseason for him to get healthy and to get right. I think that the Pacers are good enough to beat Milwaukee. I'm not a big believer in Milwaukee. Given the fact that Giannis, I don't really know his status. I'm assuming he's going to come back, but I don't know what percent he's going to be playing at. I think the Pacers are going to upset the Milwaukee Bucks in seven games. Now, the tough thing here is game seven would be back at Pfizer Forum. So the Pacers would have to win on the road in this situation, but they haven't had a problem with that. They won two games in Milwaukee already this year. Of course, Halliburton's a Wisconsin kid himself, so he's pretty comfortable there in that state. And I think the Pacers, they're going to play a little bit of upset here in round one. 
Uh, and we're going to set up a crazy 6-7 matchup in round two between the 76ers and Indiana Pacers after my predictions. The 4-5, this is another matchup where this is a tough one because the Cavaliers have been really dinged up this year. You think about how much time Evan Mobley's missed. Think about how much time Darius Garland missed. Donovan Mitchell really kind of carried the load for the Cavaliers this season during those absences. And then Donovan Mitchell himself has missed some time. Hasn't quite been right since coming back, but he's had a great season. The Cavaliers need him. The Magic don't have someone like Donovan Mitchell. Paulo Boncaro, bright, rising young star in this league, was an all-star for the first time in 2023-2024. But you're looking at a player that offensively, the, the Magic just don't have the offensive talent that Cleveland does. And Cleveland has similar defensive talent. Now, the Cavs kind of slipped up a little bit defensively this year. They weren't quite as good as they've been in years past. And I think one of the big rising problems in, in Cleveland right now is the 4-5 conversation between Jared Allen and Evan Mobley. Can those two guys actually coexist? Can they play together? If there's a series for them to prove that they can work together, it's this one right here against Orlando. The Magic do not space the floor extremely well. They don't shoot a ton of threes. They're really more of a mid-2000s, maybe 2010s offense where there's going to be a bunch of mid-range two-pointers. There's going to be shots at the rim. And I think the big thing here for Cleveland is Isaac Okoro. I'm, I'm assuming they're going to put him on Paulo Boncaro, try and make him uncomfortable at the point of attack and really try and make him feel a body at all times. Boncaro has a bad habit of turning his back to the basket anytime he's really confronted or, or kind of walled up on drives. I think if you're Cleveland and you can force him to do that, you're going to have some real problems compared to what last year um, when Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle just kind of carved up the Cavaliers defense, this Magic team doesn't have the surrounding infrastructure to cause some of those problems. They've got big, strong physical players similar to New York, but Orlando doesn't have the shooting. They don't have quite the dynamism side to side that New York has. And for that reason, I am going to pick the Cleveland Cavaliers here in six games. I think it'll be a good competitive series. Orlando Magic fans, you've got to be super happy. Not only do you have one of the catchiest songs on all of TikTok, but you've got a really great young team with a really bright future cap space this offseason if you guys want it real options to maybe improve the team really rapidly and get a, a real shot making guard or someone who can create off the dribble a lot orlando's in a great spot they're going to continue to get better franz wagner and, and Boncaro, i think both took meaningful steps forward this past season i know some people might push back on wagner i know he wasn't hitting a ton of outside shots this year but i think wagner has really taken a step forward still in his game as an overall player and i think Boncaro has as well this the sky's the limit here for orlando moving forward but for me i have the cavaliers winning again in six games which now leads me to some of my concluding thoughts in this postseason what do i expect for a finals matchup that's one of the most important things i want to talk about for me it's going to be denver versus boston i think the nuggets have been the best team in the western conference all season long the team that i feel safest picking simply because they have the best player in the world in Nikola Jokic. He continues to play at an all-world level. You know, a couple of sleepers in the West. I think the Timberwolves, if they kind of find themselves offensively and find that key role definition, which I've talked about multiple times in this video, if they find that, I think Minnesota could surprise some people because they at least have the bodies and size to give Denver issues. And I think if you're picking a team to come out of the West, you have to pick a team that you think is capable of beating Denver. I think that Minnesota has some of the pieces, and then Dallas is another sleeper team. I wouldn't pick them, but with the way that they've been playing the last 18 games or so, um, if they can kind of ride that into the playoffs, it reminds me of the 2022 playoff team that ended up making the conference finals. Now, they came short of the NBA finals, but I think the Mavericks are a sleeper to come out of the West. Wouldn't pick them again. My pick is firmly the Denver Nuggets. I trust them completely that they will be in the NBA Finals yet again. And on the East side, I don't even think it's close. The Boston Celtics will be in the NBA Finals. And if they're not, it's not because another team beat them. It's because they beat themselves. It's because they reduced themselves to playing outside of their style. It's because they forced up bad shots in isolation. It's because they didn't get to the rim enough. It really comes down to if Boston plays the way that they're supposed to play or not. If they do, they're unbeatable. I think the Celtics, there's a really good chance, I would say a 75% chance that they win the NBA Finals this year. I think they are firmly the best team in the NBA. They've got the most talent. They've got the best starting five in terms of an actual talent construction standpoint that fits within their coach's style of play and desire to play with a bunch of spacing and three-point shooting. 
I think Porzingis as a pick and popper would provide a lot of issues to Nikola Jokic. I think the Celtics have the infrastructure and the roster to win an NBA Finals this year. If they don't, it's because they got in their own way or it's because Nikola Jokic is just that good of an individual basketball player and because Mike Malone figures something out against pick and pops that he hasn't all season. I hope you guys did enjoy my playoff and play-in predictions and preview here. Let me know in the comment section below what you guys think, and I'll catch you in the very next utility sports video.